Holy Spirit, and one God, Amen. In today's reading, we hear our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ say in verse 22 and verse 23, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Oftentimes, when we contemplate on this verse, we reduce it or simplify it to refer to sins involving the eyes. So things like lust and things like that. But in fact, our Lord is going much deeper than that, much further than that. By the eye, he's referring to our how we desire, the way that we desire. He's referring to the eye so that something that sees and desires. So in fact, even we can apply this if our physical eyes don't work. We can desire things within our hearts and within our minds, regardless if we've ever even seen them or not. They have a very real image within our imagination, and they can be a a full motivating factor in our lives. For some, the motivating factor is the idea of power. For others, it's prestige, money, comfort, stability. These, there are some other motivating factors that we can mention, but our Lord tells us that whatever the eye is focused on, it becomes the whole focus of our life. If our focus is in life is wealth, for example, then we quite literally become servants of wealth. In fact, we can become servants of anything that takes our attention and captures our hearts. So the Lord says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or God and wealth. So our Lord Jesus Christ, in his mercy and his love towards mankind, he desires much more for us than we even desire for ourselves. Sometimes we desire power. He desires to give us a place as sons and daughters of God. Sometimes we desire wealth. But he desires to, to give us wealth and inheritance of the saints, which is righteousness and holiness. We desire prestige, and he desires to have fellowship with us. Us. Can you imagine? We desire security. He desires to give us stability that can't be shaken. We desire comfort. He desires to give us joy and peace. He is the king of peace. We desire love, but he desires to give us an unending, unimaginable love. We can't even, we can't even fathom. Whatever we think that we desire, when we try to find it outside of him, We actually don't find it. Sometimes we find the opposite. And some of us are thinking at this point, well, the Lord is insensitive to my needs. I have very real practical needs. Doesn't he know how I worry and I work very hard to just make a living just to get by? But in our readings today, our Lord makes it very clear that he knows. And he, he knows far better than even we can imagine what we actually need. He tells us not to be anxious about anything, about the food, the clothes, anything. Don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything. Could anything be more freeing to hear that from the creator of the universe? Don't worry. According to the teachings of Christ, most of us, I'm speaking of myself, are slaves. We're not free. We're slaves to anxiety. We're slaves to fear. We're slaves to things of this life. What we wear, what we eat, what we save. And our Lord acknowledges that we need these things, of course. But he differs on how we should approach them. Oftentimes, I'm speaking of myself, we fixate on them. We focus on them. We set our minds and our hearts on them. But our Lord teaches us the better way. Our Lord tells us that he is the way. 
He is the way to everything that we think and that we desire. And instead of chasing after illusions and shadows, we will find that he gives us much more than we ever could ever, ever imagine. This is his generosity. This is his mercy towards us. So instead of seeking after wealth and security and food and clothing, what should we be seeking? Our Lord says in verse 33, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So what should we be seeking first? The kingdom of God. And how should we be seeking it? We should be seeking it by making God and his commands and his ways the focus of our entire life. When we rise in the morning, our Lord, God willing, and I pray this is happening, should be the first thought and first objective in the day. Right when we wake up in the morning, in the Psalms we read in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So as we focus our gaze on Christ, we begin to seek him more. And as we seek him more, we find ourselves thirsty and hungry for his presence in our lives. And we find ourselves asking, how does this activity bring me closer to God? How does that activity bring me closer to God? How can I better serve you and know you, my God? So we start this as our, as our, our frame. We have to frame our mind this way and our focus our, each day like this. That's why we, the church, encourage you to start every day with morning prayers if possible. I know sometimes we, the mornings are very rushed. But the morning prayers, the morning quiet, can help us properly orient our lives if we're honest about it. And it helps us to gain energy and the blessings that we need to pass this day that is pleasing to God. So one who begins with God invites God into every aspect of his life without fear, without worry, without anxiety. He invites him with hope and expectation of joy. And then our Lord's promises will not go unfulfilled. He indeed gives us treasures. What are the treasures that we're seeking after? I hope and pray that the treasures that we're seeking after as Christians, as, as honest Christians, is the grace of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, the virtues that are along with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I, I want you to think of Great Lent as the path that we travel to find this treasure. All of his practices, all of his fasting, all of his services, all of his readings and all his prayers, these are ways for us to find the treasures along the road. St. Basil, I'm going to read you a little passage from St. Basil. He, he kind of gives it to us. He says, We claim that we desire the kingdom of heaven, and yet we neglect those things that we ensure our ability to gain entry there. And although we make no efforts to fulfill the Lord's commands, we still imagine in our foolishness that we will receive the same honors as those who have fought against sin right up to death. Who has ever stayed home at doing nothing at harvest time and managed to fill his arms with bundles of corn. Who has ever gathered grapes from the vine that he has not planted or worked hard for. Those who have worked receive the fruits. Those who are victorious are, ground, are crowned. For we must not neglect even the smallest detail of our instructions, but carry out our orders to the letter. For it is said, Blessed is that servant whom the Lord finds not doing anything but so doing. This is from St. Basil. So we enter this fast on the first Sunday of, of Great Lent with a sincere heart. And we hope that it will result in a change or transformation. Without boasting, without talking about what we're doing, our Lord says to wash our faces so that we don't even appear to be fasting to men. Because really, honestly, nobody should be doing what we're doing. Nobody should know what our, what our canons are given to our, from our Father Confession. 
I'm doing this. Can you like look at me? I'm fasting until three o'clock in the afternoon. We don't we don't do that kind of stuff. Because that's gonna that's gonna mess with your pride. No one is supposed to know anything about what we're doing. It's between you and God and your father confession. And St. Paul says, the outward man is dying when we do this. But the inner man is being renewed. And this is the kind of treasure that we're looking for. This inner man transformation. We're not necessarily looking for better external circumstances. We're not looking for better pay. Those things aren't bad. And I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't go after them. But I mean, that's not what we're doing in this particular time period of our lives. We're not focusing on how we can consume. We consume and we consume and we consume and we don't even think about what we're doing. I'm speaking for myself. During this period, we're seeking a kind of change. This inner transformation, this, this inner change that will truly allow us to be detached from those things that we love to have in our lives. A genuine sense of detachment, not disgust, not uh, condemnation. Those things aren't evil, but putting things in perspective, a proper detachment. I heard it once, I read, I don't take credit for this passage. Somebody said this once and I'm, I'm just regurgitating it to you. They, they gave an example that really highlighted this perspective. He says, I love a decent air conditioning system as much as the next man. But the fact is that you can look at these things and say, okay, this is, what, this is the thing that we have. This is good. But if it crashes tomorrow, I'm still in Christ. I just sweat more. So we have to be faithful in our, in our Lenten discipline. And it will grow and it will deepen and we will get better at this. It's a lot like athletics. We have to build endurance. We have to build up strength. We have to renew the inner man. We have to renew the inner man. And renewing the inner man restores our original beauty. It cleanses everything inside of us. We're not talking about outward beauty. We're talking about, this is the point of Lent. That that interior renewal with the fasting and the praying and the disciplines that we're seeking to clear our souls. And that's the part of the soul that gets so polluted by sin that we can't communicate with God. We find it difficult to even pray. During this time in Lent, if we're honest, it gets better. It gets cleaner. And maybe, maybe by the end of Lent, as we approach Holy Week, it may be completely cleared. Who knows? But you will be better able to communicate with God if you're honest with your Lenten disciplines. That's the treasure. That's the treasure. That's what it means to, to transform the inner man. And so in the Orthodox tradition, we talk about fasting, and we're talking about fasting not just from food, but we're talking about from every kind of evil that's out there. Fast from evil. Fast from sin. Because you can, you can fast with your actions as much as you can fast from food. And I hope that we see the correlation, that if we're disciplined with food, then quite possibly with God's grace, I can say no to sin. So we seek to cut yourself off from all those things that darken our souls. Not just the triple cheeseburgers and things like that, but all the things that can darken our souls. The anger, the, the vengeance, the resentment, the emotions and the passions that we carry with us all the time and sometimes we enjoy. We want to be upset. It's okay, let me have this. Sometimes we enjoy them. So we abstain from those things, right? We fast from the things like jealousy and laziness and self-indulgence and self-will. Fast from social media. I know that's a hard one. Don't look at them until Easter or after Easter. It will make a big difference. It makes a big difference. Those things that we think we have a grip on, that, that social media time, the device time, the screen time, the video game time, we think we have a handle on this and our pride gets in our way. It makes a big difference during Lent and, and the rest of the year. Hopefully, 
if you are honest about it during Lent, you will be weaned off the habit so that you don't have to have this urge post-Lent. All of these things distract and they prevent us from praying. They prevent us from reading scripture. They prevent us from even thinking, from even thinking clearly. So we have to be watchful for the tricks of the evil one. And we have to, that he tries to distract us during this, this amazing blessed Lenten time. He, Satan excels at presenting us with things that look good and they feel good and they taste good and they sound good. But ultimately, it leads us to a, a spiritual and emotional death. We're not really paying attention. So to conclude, our Lord says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These are the words of our Lord Christ given to us today as we have begun our Lenten journey. Our Lord has this amazing way of reorienting our thinking and even removing the blindness in order to help us see. He prepares us for this great and holy season with an important reminder that our Lenten disciplines are not simply religious observances, not tradition. They are tools to help us gain and re regain our heavenly treasures. Lent is, isn't really about suffering or denial. It's not really what this is about. It's about moving our hearts to treasure and appreciate things that actually matter. And those things have eternal significance and weight. So our Lenten disciplines are meant to give us a laser-like focus on God and his kingdom. We are among the most productive people in history of the world. And yet our Lord continually speaks to us and cries out to saying, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal. Don't do that. Reorient yourselves. Change your mind. Repent. Take the tools given to us by Christ and the church. Work hard. Be relentless in this work. Become the most productive person in the world, but produce something that's worthy of the name Christian. Our bank accounts and savings accounts, which are here, cannot possibly help us in our next permanent home. So our Lord tells us to struggle and to save our heavenly savings account. And I pray that we toil and labor and struggle, but only for that which is eternal and heavenly. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Je bénio.